Okay, in this video we're going to look at how to prove that the derivative of the inverse secant function is what we claimed it was. So uh, we're going to start this the same way we looked at some previous examples. Um, so this is our claim, what we're going to prove. So for the first step of our proof, we're going to start with what our given is or what our assumption is. So we're going to start with just our function, uh, the secant inverse function. So I'm going to write that as y equals. Uh, okay, so then we're going to proceed from there and just from that and things that we've already shown to be true, uh, hopefully be able to show that this is the derivative of that function. All right, so just like we did when we looked at some other ones, um, what I'm going to do is use the definition of an inverse function and implicit differentiation to show that this is true. All right, so if we know that y is the inverse secant of x, then just by definition of what an inverse function is, that would mean that secant of y is x. So let me put a little uh, word there. So then secant of y equals x. All right, and we know that with all of the inverse trig functions, there are some uh, restrictions on what those variables can be. So I'm going to just go over here to the side and do a little quick graph to help me think about what possible values those x's and y's could take. So if you don't know what the graph of the secant inverse function looks like, that's okay. Uh, but you should be able to figure it out based on other graphs that you do know. So uh, you might know what the graph of the secant function looks like. If not, you can think about the graph of the cosine function. Hopefully you know that. So I'm just going to do a little sketch here of a graph of a cosine wave. I'm going to do that dash because that's not the real graph I'm after here. All right, so there's a graph of a cosine wave, and I can scale the axes there. Uh, and then the secant function, so I'm going to graph the secant function, uh, is the reciprocal of the cosine function. So any place the cosine function outputs 0, the secant function would have vertical asymptotes. The secant function would be undefined. And so this would be at pi over 2, and this would be 3 pi over 2, and negative pi over 2. And then the secant function reciprocals uh, the outputs of the cosine function. So any place the cosine function is positive at this place here, uh, at z x equals 0, the cosine function outputs 1. And so the reciprocal of 1 is 1. That's going to stay the same. But as those outputs get closer to zero, when I take the reciprocal of them, the outputs will grow bigger and bigger. And so the secant function graph, you might remember the shape. It looks like these sort of U shapes. Uh, but to get the placement of them right, I tend to think about, I don't always draw, uh, but think about the graph of the cosine function to think about that. All right, so this is a little graph of the secant function, and I use that to help me think about the graph that I really want to think about here, the secant inverse function. So the secant function is not one-to-one, -one, so in order to think about an inverse function, you have to restrict to a region where it is one-to-one -one so that you can define that inverse. All right, so just like we talked about with all the other inverse trig functions, you want to do that as close to zero as possible. You want to use as much of the graph uh, that keeps the function one-to-one. -one. All right, so we're going to start here at zero. I'm just going to highlight the part that you would restrict to define the inverse secant function. So I'm going to start here at zero. We're going to use the positive values. I can use either the positive or the negative side of zero. I can't use both, or it wouldn't be one-to-one -one or pass horizontal line test. So we'll use the positive part. And then when I get to here, I can keep going and keep using part of this graph to define. But uh, eventually, when I get over to here, I can't go past this bump because then it wouldn't be one to one anymore. So this part that I highlighted right there is the part that we're going to use to define the inverse secant function that I need here. And again, all of this thinking about graphs is really to help me make sense of some of these variables, these x and y variables, and whether they're going to be positive or negative, and um, what intervals they might be in when I think about defining this. All right, so I'm going to graph here the inverse secant function. So I'm just taking this part that I've highlighted here and then thinking about how inverse functions work. So it switches around the roles of inputs and outputs and x's and y's. So here on the secant function, where we have vertical asymptotes. Those will correspond to horizontal asymptotes on the inverse function. And then your input and output 
coordinates of points will switch around. So for example, this point that's at 0, 1 will correspond to a point over here at 1, 0. And uh, this part of the graph here, which approaches as x grows from 0 to pi over 2, the y values get infinitely large. The roles will switch. So as y grows from 0 to pi over 2, the x values will extend out there. Uh, and then over here, uh, I've got a point here. This would be pi negative 1 on the secant function graph. So on the inverse secant function graph, I'll have negative 1 comma pi, a point up here at negative 1 comma pi. And then this part of the graph that approaches that asymptote on the inverse function will look like that. Okay, so that helps us think a little bit about our variables here, x's and y's that I have over here. Um, so this is the graph of the inverse function uh, that we started with here, and that helps you think about the little x and y values. So I'm going to just make a note here. Uh, that will be relevant when we get to the end here uh, about whether our values should be positive or negative. Okay, so this is the graph that I'm really looking at to help determine my x's and y's. Um, so the x can be less than negative 1 or greater than 1, less than or equal to negative 1. And the y values will be between 0 and pi over 2, not including pi over 2, and then pi over 2 to pi. So uh, let's see, let's do y is in um, 0 to pi over 2 and pi over 2 to pi. Okay, um, so that kind of will just help us as we move along in our proof here. All right, so just like we did before, uh, we mentioned we're going to use the definition of the inverse function and then implicit differentiation to help get our derivatives here. So I'm going to take this last step that I had before I thought about the, the values for the variables, and I'm going to differentiate that with respect to x. So I'm going to use some notation here that indicates that, the derivative with respect to x of secant of y. And that's going to be equal to the derivative with respect to x of x. So I just took that prior step and I'm differentiating both sides of that equation with respect to x. Okay, so on the left side here, this is where we use the implicit differentiation. So we've already shown that the derivative of the secant function is secant times tangent. And then this is where we have the implicit differentiation. Since we're differentiating with respect to x, we'll have that times dy dx. That's really a chain rule there. And then on the right side, we have 1. Um, all right, so then at this point, uh, we want to solve for dy dx, and then we're going to use either some identities or a triangle to help get back to uh, what we're trying to show here. So when I divide through here by secant y tangent y, though, I have to be a little careful. Uh, when I do that, uh, I would be dividing by 0, depending on my values that I have here for secant and tangent. So uh, all right, so we'll, we'll note that in the next step. But, all right, so I'll have 1 over secant y times tangent y, or you can rewrite that a little bit if you want. Okay, so uh, we used a triangle when we talked about this before. Uh, I'm going to use an identity this time, actually, instead of using a triangle to kind of finish this. Um, so what we did, though, was we used the relationship that we had, uh, secant y equals x, and I drew a triangle when I did this before. Uh, I'm going to just use an identity this time. And I use that to help get this in terms of x. So you can see right here that uh, the secant y is just going to be able to be replaced by x. The tangent y, for that, I'm going to need to either draw a triangle or use an identity. Part of the reason I'm using an identity here instead of a triangle is the idea that I have angles here that are bigger than pi over 2 or bigger than 90 degrees. And so when you draw a right triangle and you're thinking about that, you're really looking at angles that are less than 90 degrees in your right triangle. So just to be careful about some um, negatives and some things that are going to happen uh, when we have angles that are in this interval, that's why I'm going to use an identity this time. Okay, so in place of the secant y, we'll be able to put x. And then I need to think about the tangent 
y. So I want to take this relationship here and connect that to tangent y. So if you don't remember very many trig identities, hopefully at least you remember kind of the most basic trig identity of all, Pythagorean identity, sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equals 1. And then you can manipulate that to get other Pythagorean identities uh, involving other trig functions. So if I take this identity and I divide through by cosine squared theta, I'll get sine squared theta over cosine squared theta, which is tangent squared theta, plus, and remember I'm dividing through by cosine squared theta, so this term will be cosine squared theta over cosine squared theta, which is 1. And then on the right side, 1 over cosine squared theta will be secant squared theta. Okay, so this provides an identity that relates the secant function to the tangent function. So we can use that to get our tangent y. All right, so using this relationship that I put a box around and this identity here, we can have then, so uh, tangent squared y, I'm using trig functions of y here, plus 1 equals secant squared y, uh, which will just be x squared. All right, and so here, now I can solve that for tangent of y and then be able to substitute in here. So I'll subtract 1 from both sides and then square root both sides to isolate the tangent function. So when I do that, I have to be a little bit careful here. When I square root both sides, I'm going to have a plus or minus here to be careful about. So that's part of why I emphasize some things here on the intervals. All right, so our dy dx here, we're going to substitute in, uh, and I'm actually going to split this into two parts here, depending on where our x values are. Uh, so for the x's that are greater than 1, greater than or equal to 1, um, we are going to look at this relationship here. So for the x's that are greater than or equal to 1, um, the secant of y is just going to be x, so we get... 1 over x. And when x is greater than or equal to 1, uh, the y value here will be in the interval 0 to pi over 2. And so if you think about the tangent of angles that are between 0 and pi over 2, in that case, the tangent of, ang tangent of angles between 0 and pi over 2 is positive. So in that case, we'll use the positive here, square root of x squared minus 1. And when I have x values that are less than or equal to negative 1, the other interval here, our secant of y will still be x, but the tangent of y, when you think about that, the tangent of y, when x is less than or equal to negative 1, the y values will be between pi over 2 and pi, and tangent for angles that are between pi over 2 and pi will be negative. So I'll use the negative square root that time. I'll put the minus sign out front here. Okay, so I've got two different expressions here, uh, neither of which is exactly what I was trying to prove as my derivative. Um, so it's okay to write the derivative this way and have kind of two different expressions depending on where x is. But you actually can tidy that up and combine those two things uh, to get what we have here. Notice that when x is greater than or equal to 1, x is positive, and this expression that I have here is really the same as what I have up here. If I take the absolute value of a positive number, it doesn't change anything. And when x is less than or equal to negative 1, if we look at this expression here, notice that x is negative. And so the minus sign in front of here will take the negative value I'm putting in for x and change the sign on it. And another way to think about that is that you're changing the sign. You can think about that as an absolute value. So these two can be combined into the expression that we were really after if we recognize that this minus sign is changing a negative value for x to a positive, so it's having the same effect as this absolute value. All right, one other little thing here I need to be careful about, which has to do with domain. Uh, so at the beginning, our secant inverse function, uh, we talked about that the x values could be less than or equal to negative 1 or greater than or equal to 1. But if you notice, this derivative here is going to be undefined when I have x equal to positive 1 or negative 1. So the derivative is really only actually defined when x is greater than 1. Erase that or x is less than negative 1. The function uh, 
The original function is defined at positive and negative 1, but the derivative does not exist at those points. If you look at the graph of the function, you might be able to see why. Uh, if you look at those tangent lines, you can see there's really a vertical tangent line at those points where x is positive and negative 1. So this derivative is really only valid for x less than negative 1 and x greater than 1, even though the original function is defined for these x values equal to the derivative exists only on these intervals. All right, so at that point, we've proved our derivative that we claimed, and so that's the end of our proof. And if you really want to write QED at the end, you can do that. Uh, but anyway, that's what we've proved. So you're going to be asked to do that on several different instances with different trig functions, triangle, graphs, and identities. There's a couple different ways to justify this part here, but the logic here is pretty much the same every time. Inverse function, implicit differentiation, and then either an identity or a triangle to help you substitute in to what you get from the implicit differentiation.